Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the 2022 Grand Challenge Finale of the ITU Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning for 5G Challenge. My name is Mianishu from the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva. Today, I have the honor of moder moderating this ceremony, which will be awarding the best solutions submitted and presented at the playoffs we had from November 29th to December 1st. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs. IT makes standards, allocates frequencies to service that make use of the radio communication spectrum and assist developing countries in setting up their communication infrastructure. The AI and 5G challenge is organized under ITU and today we welcome you to our third grand challenge finale. The journey started in 2020 when we first heard it, hosted our first edition of the ITU AI ML and 5G challenge. This challenge aims to promote the development and deployment of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies in 5G networks creating a platform where students and professionals from all across the world can contribute to the development of AI ML and communication networks. Across those three years, we have seen impressive solutions that are top tier level. Today, we'll be presenting selected solutions from various problem statements, a featured talk from a distinguished speaker, award ceremony for the best solutions, and much, much more. To kickstart the session, it is my great pleasure to welcome the Director of the Telecommunication Standardization Bureau in ITU, Chase of Lee, to say a few words. Yeah, thank you very much, Mia. Uh, very good day, everyone. Welcome to the grand finale of the uh, 2022 edition of this ITU AI Machine Learning 5G Challenge. I'm very delighted. We are here to celebrate our hard work and the cutting edge solutions of the teams who participated in this year's challenge. I'm happy, happy to say that today's session marks the third successful ITU AI machine learning in 5G challenge. The challenge encourages and supports the growing community, driving the integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning in networks at the same time, the strengthens the community driving IT standard works for AI machine learning. The challenge is a competition that is open to all students and the professionals across the world. It's a wonderful opportunity for people from various backgrounds to come together to work on these problem statements. We believe that the competition helps create the collaborative culture that is necessary for success in emerging and the future networks and create new opportunities for industry and the academia to influence the evolution of IQ standards. While it is not an easy task to put, on, put out a competition of this magnitude, we have seen over the years that the challenge is producing many positive results and experiences for both hosts and the many participants from around the world. So I'm also proud to say the submitted solutions are also improving every year. And I am happy, I'm, we are very helping. Those contributions are very helping us improve the standards required to develop communication networks. So I'm excited to see these solutions contributing to the IT standards work. And I also hope to see them uh, published in our IT technical journal on future and evolving technologies. So far, two special issues from the solutions of the challenge 
have been published in the IQ Technical Journal. The competition has also diversified and the new competitions have been hosted this year, namely the Geo AI Challenge and the Tiny ML Challenge. The challenge would not have been possible without our sponsors, GTE and the Ministry of Science and ICT Republic of Korea. I would also like to thank the experts who have made their time and knowledge available to generate the problem statements, to be on the challenge management board and to be on the judges panel. And of course, I want to thank the many participants who signed up for this competition and the submitted solutions. So I will see you again for the award ceremony later in this program. Thank you very much. Back to you, Mia. Thank you very much for your opening remarks. To the audience members, please feel free to interact with other participants and audience members via the chat on the neural network. I'd like, now, I'd like to now introduce my two colleagues who have managed the entire challenge since the very beginning, Thomas and Vishnu. They have managed everything from bringing together the problem statements, creating the judges panel, setting up the various mentoring events, and overall leading all of us successfully to this grand challenge finale. Nothing would have worked without Vishnu and Thomas, and I'd like to now ask Thomas to give a snapshot of this year's challenge. Over to you. Uh, thank you a lot, Mia, uh, for the introduction. I'll, I'll give you just a quick uh, overview of the challenge this year. So it's, it's, it's nice that we are coming to the end of the third edition. Uh, it's really nice to see the solutions that have been brought forward. And this is just a quick overview uh, of what I'm going to present in the next few minutes. So we started off uh, basically in around February, curating the problem statements. And of course, around June is when we have all the hope, the energy, everyone uh, announcing the problem statements. As you can see, everyone is happy and hopeful that it's going to be a good year, great time to learn something new, contribute to 5G and future networks. And of course, we around October, end of October is when we have the uh, submission of, of the uh, solutions and everyone is tired. But now we are here on 14 December, everyone really looking forward to the, to win, you know, to get some awards, recognition and prizes. So thank you very much everyone for participating in the challenge this year. And uh, what, what we, do in the challenge is that we'd like to create a community. So we want to have this community of value where you can come and learn from each other, collaborate, of course, between students and professionals, uh, learn from the experts, contribute and rely on each other. So we have had the webinars, roundtables, hands-on session, mentorship sessions. Of course, uh, our hosts, we are very thankful to many hosts who brings baseline models. Uh, for, the, for our participants of the challenge. And this year we have hosted um, more than 35 sessions. So these sessions uh, stem from uh, the webinars, which are technical talks. Apart from the technical talks, we have also problem statement uh, webinars. We have uh, the round tables, mentoring sessions, and many more. So you, you can, if you would like to watch the replays, you, we have the uh, AI for Good YouTube uh, playlist, and you can see all the recordings of the past sessions. And also, I'd like to thank all the hosts who have hosted the problem statements this year. Uh, we have Arizona State University, Barcelona Neural Network, CTTC, University of Fabra in Barcelona, Linux Foundation, ZTE, China Mobile Rise in Japan, NIST in US, KTJ in Japan, ITU, and Northeastern University in US. So a big thank you to all these for making possible that we have the data sets, we have the baseline code, we have the problem statement set up, set out for this year. And this is just a quick snapshot of uh, some of the problem statements that we had. Uh, you can see that we had a lot. We had in total 13 problem statements that we uh, shared out for our participants. And some of the highlights, I think uh, this year, we had a problem statement that was uh, really looking on the data-centric data -centric approach as compared to the model-centric approach. Because in the current uh, machine learning landscape, 
Uh, most of the times people are looking at building the best machine learning model architecture, hyperparameter tuning or optimization to make sure that your model performs well, but they forget about the data part. And now we're just, we were lucky to have a problem statement looking at the data part. How can you systematically engineer the data to build better machine learning models? We also had, uh, we considered multiple modalities. So multi-model machine learning where you have data from different sensors and then you can use it to train your machine learning model for predictions. And of course, one problem statement look also looked upon us so, uh, on the energy consumption. So I hope in future we can really contribute to building efficient uh, machine learning models that, that, that are efficient in terms of energy consumption uh, in training, but also at the same time doing inference. And another approach is in federated learning. So these are some of the highlights for the 2022 challenge. In terms of prizes, uh, we have three prizes, uh, three big prizes. We have the gold, which is the first prize, 3,000 Swiss francs, the silver, 2,000 Swiss francs, and the bronze, 1,000 francs. And of course, the winner will receive a winner certificate uh, on top of the award money. We also have extra awards that was determined uh, by the ITU. So on top of these three top prizes, we have the runner up, they receive 500 encouragement award, 500 Swiss francs, best student award, 300 Swiss francs, uh, public poll winner, the best solution uh, by the public will be 300 Swiss francs. And we have an order of omission uh, with no monetary prize, but a certificate to honor our solutions. And I would like, at this point, I would like to thank our sponsors, ZTE and Minister of ICT, uh, Minister of Science and ICT, Korea Republic. But also we had technical partners. We had Jarvis Labs AI uh, from India. This is a company that helped to provide this compute platform that we gave out for free to participants of the challenge. And we have AI in China who helped us with the interface that we are using for problem statement registration and other processing. And in terms of the statistics, uh, so in this case, I'm just talking about the uh, teams that were formulated and the participants in those teams. Uh, this year we had 13 open challenges and amongst these 13 challenges, we had 273 teams that were created, which comprised of 461 members. And uh, from these, we had 60 submissions from 162 participants. So thank you to everyone who uh, joined the challenge and submitted a solution at the end um, for this uh, 2022 third edition of the ITUA and Machine and 5G Challenge. And looking at the gender panel uh, balance for the participants, we are not talking about all people who registered, but only participants in the teams who submitted a solution. We had 53 male and 12% female. We had others because this part is a big percentage, but uh, most of the participants who registered opted not to give out their information, whether they are male or female or whether they are student or professional. So we don't have enough information. So I hope in future uh, iterations of the challenge, you will be able to give us your full information so that we have a pretty good idea of who participated. Is it a student, a professional, is it male or female? And how can we improve to reach out uh, to other demographics as well? And this is the rough uh, participation from different countries uh, for the people who submitted solution. And we, we always run a survey. And in this survey, we ask people, what is your motivation to participate in the challenge? And you can see that for 5%, uh, is to accelerate in terms of their professional career or studies to gain some extra skills uh, in this uh, space of machine learning in communication metrics. Yeah, and this year we provided uh, IT compute for free to participants, but it's very surprising that uh, when we asked if people had access or they knew about it, 50% did not know that we are providing free compute. So this is really surprising, but we hope that we can do better uh, in the next, in future, to make sure that we provide this uh, access to teams, to participants of the challenge. Uh, the next steps, I would like to mention that uh, 
We provide, we try, we recommend that our solutions be open sourced. Uh, currently we have more than 100 GitHub repositories from the past three editions uh, where you can access the code, the reports and the slides. But also we have published two special issues with the ITU Journal for Future and Evolving Technologies. Uh, in the first year we had 10 papers and last year, or um, the uh, solutions from last year, which were published uh, this year were 16 papers. And of course, some, some participants uh, publish in other journals, uh, for example, ACM, IEEE, as well as some, some submit their solutions to conferences, which is quite encouraging to see how the work that is being done in the challenge is contributing in, in other areas as well. So this year also, we are going to uh, announce a new special issue. So I'm inviting everyone who submitted a solution to turn your submissions, your reports into a a journal manuscript that can be submitted for the ITU journal. We are going to announce the call for papers early January next year. And the leading guest editor is Professor Ahmed from Arizona State University. And we have other guest editors as well uh, in the pipeline. So uh, I'm looking forward to receiving everyone's submissions uh, to this special issue. At this point in time, I would like to finish uh, uh, my presentation. So thank you everyone. and. Uh, good luck to all teams and to everyone who participated. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Mia. Thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you again for all the hard work you've done this year. I'd like to now begin with our final presentations, which will give an overview of the solutions from the challenge. So again, each team has three minutes to present uh, before your time is up. So 30 seconds before your time is up, I'll be ringing this bell. So once you hear that, please make sure to start finishing and wrapping up your presentation. At the end of all the presentations, we will have a public poll on the public best solution and the team with the most votes will win the public poll prize. Each and every one of you who is connected right now will have a chance to vote for a team that you deem the best amongst these presenters today. So make sure to stay until the very end to vote. If you have any questions for the presenters as well, please type them in the chat on the neural network and we will take them right after all the presentations are finished. So I'd first like to invite Team X Seeding for the problem statement classification of home network users to improve user experience. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so this is my presentation for the home user network classification challenge. So this is a quick uh, outline of the problem statement. Um, the essential idea is that user experience while using broadband internet is becoming a top priority for network operators worldwide to ensure good service. And predictive AI slash ML models can help operators discover um, in which users um, are having a good or bad experience and according to that, which ones would maybe be complaining ahead of time so that they can diagnose their issues. Um, uh, ZTE has told us, has figured out that the user experience reflects in eight key indicators from DPI probe readings. Um, as you can see from the graphs, the users with bad experiences and users with good experiences have uh, different uh, indicators. Uh, users with bad experiences tend to be more sporadic and uh, have more outliers in general. So using this, um, the idea is to create a machine learning model that can classify whether a user is having a bad or good experience at that point in time. This is now a quick outline of the solution that I developed for the challenge. Um, so essentially the first step in my pipeline is an automatic extraction of the thousands of features from these indicators to get new insights into the dynamics. So as you can see from the picture on the top left, it can get statistics at the max number of peaks, media mean, and amongst many others. And after you, have, after all these features are gathered from these users, a machine learning model can classify these features into whether the user is having a good or bad experience. And this full pipeline has been able to achieve up to 67% accuracy, even in cases where um, the indicators are not very different from each other, which was a big problem in the challenge that sometimes the indicators are not that different, but you know, you have good and bad experience. But even in that case, the model is able to perform pretty well. And this is just a quick overview of uh, how it compares to other uh, solutions or methods. 
um, this this method offered a 27% accuracy improvement over um, deep learning methods uh, and 11% accuracy over traditional ML methods. And since the data and the challenges was was so limited, uh, I, you can we can even expect almost a 10 to 15 percent accuracy improvement with more data availability in the future. So uh, overall, the product is as such that if you get the data for any user, these eight indicators, you're able to automatically plug it in no matter the length of time or anything. You can just plug it in into the algorithm and it will automatically be able to tell whether the user has a good or bad experience uh, with a 67% accuracy with the room for 10 to 15% improvement in the future given more data. Um, that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'd next like to ask Team Euclid to start the presentation, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Vasilios Perifanis from, from Democracy University of Trace, and today I will be presenting a solution for 5G traffic forecasting based on federated learning. As we all know, 5G technology is revolutionizing the way we connect and communicate. It offers uh, faster speeds and lower latency, enabling a wide range of new applications. However, with these benefits come new challenges for network operators, including the need for efficient and accurate traffic forecasting. With timely accurate predictions, we ensure reliable services, proactive network planning, and optimization. Traditional approaches for traffic forecasting rely on centralized data collection and model training, which can be inefficient and vulnerable to privacy breaches. Our solution addresses this problem using federated learning, a novel machine learning approach that allows multiple parties to collaborate with, to collaborate with the training model without sharing their individual data. In summary, at its federated round, a central server acting as the coordinator transmits the global model weights to the selected base stations. The base stations download the parameters, perform local training, and transmit the resulting updated weights to the central server. The server executes an aggregation algorithm to generate the new global weights, and this process continues until the model converges. One of the key observations we made during our research is that each base station holds its own unique patterns, resulting in non-independent and identically distributed data. This poses several challenges for machine learning algorithms, but our solution is able to effectively handle it. We found that uh, pre-processing heavily influences the learning performance and that aggregation algorithms specifically designed to handle the non-IAD data issue do not significantly outperform simple baselines. The predictive accuracy of our federated models is on par with centralized training while offering the added benefit of privacy protection. One of the major advantages of federated learning is its low carbon footprint, at least compared to the centralized training methods. Finally, we provide a high level comparison of federated learning with centralized and local training. Both federated and centralized learning enable collaborative model generation and ensure good generalization performance. However, only federated and local training minimize privacy concerns. And also in terms of dynamic execution, both federated and local learning are capable, but local training is limited by the data of a single entity. In conclusion, our solution for 5G traffic forecasting using federated learning offers several benefits, including high predictive accuracy, low carbon footprint, privacy protection, and opens new research directions for forecasting traffic demand in 5G networks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to next call for Team Avatar. So, thank you very much. I'm Maximilian Arnold from Team Avatar. I'm going to talk about 5G millimeter wave deployment enabled through AI. Uh, let's start with a little bit more motivation why this topic is very important. Let's say we have a challenge of wide, uh, widespread deployment of millimeter waves. So this is a 
statistics about 5G, what from 7th of November 2022, where we see currently what is available in frequency and what frequency range is used. So if we take a look at, for example, at sub 1 gigahertz, we see that 15% of the devices are using uh, sub 1 gigahertz, 23 are using 1 to 2.6 uh, gigahertz, and the most and the majority are using sub 6 gigahertz. But uh, what we wanted to see is um, how does millimeter wave in a deployment perform? So we see only 9%, although a millimeter wave device were available longer ago, um, is adopted. So, and there's the question why is this? So, let's start the reasoning why is this and what we want to improve with AI here. So we have challenges and issues in millimeter wave uniform access. So we have the issue that we need to be due to the higher frequency, we need to align transmitter and receiver correctly. We have mobility, meaning that we have a pinpoint beam towards a specific user and we need to update it based on its mobility. We have some heterogeneity problems like link out is based on multi-cell, but this is not that important. And we have the non-line of slide problem. Due to the high frequency, we cannot penetrate that much through walls. That's why it always millimeter wave stays most of the time indoors. So, and which problems we are going to tackle with AI to make it adaptable into the environment are these three. So we are hoping to increase saying, can we predict with multimodal, with camera sensor, with GPS, with LiDAR, radar, the next predicted beam, can we say, okay, without, uh, using too much energy saying can we track it and can we predict blockage beforehand to update then our means and the answer is yes and no we're trying our best to go uh, a step further so uh, our solution is a camera based with gps regularization meaning we have a car driving around the street and then we have some reflecting objects but in the end the serving beam is the green one and we have a predicting blockage and we're using a camera system to do an autoencoder system to get use the latent space and then use a form of gps regularization gps is not always available it's only periodically available and irregular statements and then we're trying to predict the next beam so what we see from our result is that uh, exploiting this latent space in conjunction with the GPS regularization, we are able to de detect the target in the latent and Im image space. So we can say, okay, what is a wanted UE? We can predict if the UE will be blocked and then start uh, to adjust our scenarios. For example, if we start now into driving the bus into our blockage area, we can try to find the ne best next beam by using camera and GPS. Thank you very much for your attention. That's my presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to next call for MLab MFP. Please share your screen. Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Hey, my name is Tiwon Lee, a member of MLab MFP. And I will explain about the problem we worked on, which is network failure prediction on CNFs 5GC with Linux eBPF. This challenge was about predicting the registration failure at 10 minutes using the data set provided for this challenge. Using this data set, we worked on task one, which was using all metrics for the prediction and task two by selecting a part of the metrics. For training the model, we used the regression model of AutoGlue and Tabular, which is an open source AutoML framework. We took different strategies for normal and abnormal cycles in training data tuning. We downsampled the normal cycles by taking rows at constant interval in order to reduce false alarm after the prediction time. And for the failure cycles, we used only early stage of failure to achieve early prediction. This is a brief summary of the results on task one. We succeeded in predicting at 120 seconds with F1 score over 0 0.9. In task two, for extracting the important features, we use random forest feature importance of the model of the task one model. Here we found that the features referring to DMTCPRTT and C advisor container memory RSS are important in this prediction. So we use 96 six columns in total for the prediction in task two. This is a summary of the results in task two. Here we succeeded in predicting at 130 seconds. 
As a summary, I would like to explain about the originality of our work. The main concept of our work is letting the model apply failure prediction for all data. Unlike the other teams predicting the network failure at a specific time, our team tracked at all data until the end. By doing this, we made sure that the, our model would be able to support other data no matter when the failure event starts. This concept of our work responds to the versatility of our work. In addition, our team succeeded in extracting two types of features that are important in this pr network prediction while, main, while using less columns but maintaining early prediction or early prediction time. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. I will next call for AA Vision, please. Yep. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yep. Thank you, Mia. Uh, we are from the team uh, AA Vision, myself, uh, Anuj Abraham. So uh, we have worked on the problem statement, uh, which is on uh, sliding uh, lecture videos. And uh, the today's presentation is uh, like based on uh, usage of uh, multi-loss uh, function to improve the test detection and uh, segmentation. So, so often you have seen in YouTube uh, having a feature like uh, the segments in the videos are like timestamps and uh, the user can actually navigate to their uh, inter uh, uh, which part of the video to be get more interested. So uh, our main task uh, here is to uh, um, uh, actually uh, having uh, uh, improve the text detection and segmentation for the lecture video uh, for this particular. And this we are motivated from uh, our own team member paper, uh, which is like published in 2021 in uh, IEEE single process letters as well as in uh, computer journal, uh, which is based on uh, uh, object recognition. So uh, the feature work was attempted on uh, 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 multi-loss detection and segmentation that uh, we have uh, uh, attempted uh, in this uh, particular work. So here we propose uh, a classroom le learning approach uh, to obtain a high discriminative uh, feature extraction uh, without any extra burden or contribution into the uh, network ar architecture. And uh, uh, we are from the traditional uh, single loss function. We are able to uh, uh, design a, a multi-loss uh, uh, approach, which is uh, like uh, uh, which is based on the classroom uh, uh, based approach strategies uh, rather than on the network uh, architecture. And uh, what are the key contributions and advantages we attain is it gives a significant boost in the uh, performance by uh, five percentage, as well as uh, we didn't make change any uh, architectural changes uh, in the from the baseline work, and we used uh, the same ResNet 101 network uh, as in the baseline. And uh, a negligible computation modulation uh, for the computation cost is what uh, expected and we have achieved in this one. As a part of the REPS uh, ablation study, the KPI is uh, for the accuracy uh, area of the curve, as well as for the uh, uh, F1 score, uh, we have achieved around an improvement of 1.9 percentage and 5.2 percentage, uh, respectively, from the baseline work. And in terms of computation, uh, uh, we could save uh, around uh, 30 uh, 7.2 percentage of computation cost uh, with uh, when compared with the uh, baseline work using uh, the RSNet 101 using our uh, proposed method. And uh, some of the applications and uh, use cases uh, where we can uh, see is like mainly intended on the uh, summarization of uh, notes from lecture videos uh, to make it automated and to do some correlation analysis, uh, which is very useful for the students as well as for the professionals uh, who is uh, working. And it can also be uh, uh, attempted for uh, the document analysis. So for example, in case of uh, building, and uh, we need to understand the text and uh, the what is the categorization we have to do, all those things can be done with this implementation of this algorithm. Similarly, uh, think about a uh, future where robot, your robot is going to the stationary shop and uh, uh, it's like assisting and uh, getting your groceries and coming back. So the robot is, should be able to well detect the uh, uh, text uh, which is written on uh, labels written on the uh, uh, covers. So uh, it is also very, will be very useful for the, in the shopping malls. Another application uh, where we are looking into is the forensic uh, uh, linguistics for the text reading. It can also be used for uh, tracking. You are out of time. Google. Please wrap up in the next 10 seconds. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to next call for Digital Twin. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, 
Okay. okay, good day, everyone. I'm here to talk about autonomous networks. With the growing complexity and growth in the number of connected devices, autonomous networks are the answer for the future of telecommunications. An autonomous network is basically a network that has the capability of fixing itself. And for that, it's going to use a series of modules or little pieces of software that it's going to combine using AI in order to create controllers that would solve specific problems. For this combination, a very interesting idea is to use evolutionary algorithms that, that mimic the evolution that we find in, in nature itself. But in order to achieve this, we need um, an architecture that can um, make it possible. So can, how can we achieve this in reality? Well, there are several challenges that arise from this, like how can we keep track of the evolution process or how can we ensure trust inside a distributed network, as well as where are we going to store the information and how can we automate the whole deployment and evolution process? With these ideas in mind, we've implemented our own decentralized architecture for the evolution of controllers in an autonomous network, including an integrated marketplace. So let's dig in a little deeper. Here's our proposed architecture for the exchange of evolution information between controllers. And from this, we asked ourselves, how can we ensure a secure and traceable evolution? Well, for that, we've combined a private Ethereum blockchain with a distributed and decentralized file system, IPFS, in order to create a fully decentralized marketplace that keeps track of the entire evolution process. Uh, this marketplace is a distributed network of several nodes that are part of all the actors. And uh, regarding the controllers and modules that I mentioned before, uh, we've also created a basis for the definition of controllers and modules with Python classes that implement math operations and equations. Here are some examples of JSON representations uh, that are stored in the marketplace and exchanged throughout the process. And lastly, we've used Tosca to ensure the automatic deployment of controllers. So, if you want to know a little bit more about proof, our proof of concept and the technologies that we've used, you can scan this QR code or follow this link to see our GitHub repository. And to sum up, we've uh, been able to solve all the presented uh, initial challenges by ensuring trust, integrity, auditability, fault tolerance, and scalability in the evolution of controllers in autonomous networks with an architecture that implements a uh, decentralized and secure marketplace and effectively enables implementations of evolution, future implementations of evolution. Okay, we're Team Digital Twins, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to next call for Team 6G ISAC. Please start sharing your screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Ashwin Reddy from Samsung Research Institute in Bangalore. Our team 6G ISAC works on applications that go beyond 5G. In this challenge, our goal is to develop a machine learning framework for depth estimation using communication signals in 6G. Uh, integrated sensing and communication using uses existing communication infrastructure like spectrum, devices and protocols to perform both communication and sensing. The next step envisioned in this direction is creating digital twin of the physical world. This digital twin can then be used to solve problems like beam selection virtually. Uh, creating a digital twin using RF signals implies recreating a whole room having hundreds of objects. Traditionally, this depth map has been done using LiDAR. So we need to train a model with RF signals as input and LiDAR as ground truth. This is the room in which measurements are taken. We have a transmitter at a fixed location on the left and receiver moving in different areas of the room. Observation of the room changes with receiver location and orientation. The challenge is to estimate the depth map of the environment at each receiver position using millimeter waves. In other words, we train an ML model that takes in channel impulse response as the input and generates LiDAR point cloud as output. Uh, why is this problem so challenging to solve? Uh, there has not been much research where low, low resolution RF data is taken as input to generate high resolution LiDAR output. So our solution is novel and first of its kind. LiDAR sensing is at higher frequency and is guided by laser beam, while RF sensing is limited by sampling rate and number of antennas. LiDAR also gives more reflections compared to RF sensor. So therefore, output dimension is quite larger than the input dimension. 
Now coming to the outline of the solution, the input RF data has transmission and reception at physically separate locations, also known as bi-static mode. Whereas uh, LiDAR sends and receives laser signals from same location, also known as monostatic mode. So pre-processing step handles the deterministic aspects of the transforming the data format. This additional step makes our solution unique and makes model learning faster and understandable. So that's the outline uh, of the, our solution and going into the actual steps involved. Uh, this block diagram details our solution, which has uh, the pre-processing step uh, to create the data in similar format as the LiDAR, and then the ML model with an upsampling layer and the multiple CNN layers to generate the dense point curve. Here are some snapshots of the actual PCD and the predicted PCD. You can see that the ML model proposed returns LiDAR like high resolution point codes and the change in perception across location and orientation is nicely captured in the predicted PCD. Quantitatively, we get an, we get, uh, an average sample distance of 2 meters square and 1 meter square for samples closer to transmitters. Uh, for future work, we intend to increase the performance and generalizability of the model. And in virus sense, uh, for as far as applications go, in virus sensing, we have multiple sensing applications like uh, localization, detection of people and obstacles, and their interaction with the environment. And for each of these applications, we have solutions with custom pre-processing steps which require virus domain knowledge and ML algorithms co-opted for current use. In our algorithm, we have trained a model that translates virus channel state information to generate a digital representation of the 3D physical world. Therefore, using this digital twin as input, we can enable multiple RF sensing applications without the need for custom pre-processing that requires virus domain knowledge. We can leverage existing deep learning architectures designed for images and videos from physical world to operate on the digital representation we generated from the virus data. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, yeah. that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to next call for team Ghost Ducks. Hello, can you see me on my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Just a second, I think I'm not sharing the right screen. Okay, you can see my presentation, right? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, so hello, I'm from the GhostDuck team. We participated in the Graph Neural Networking Challenge. The motivation for the challenge is building a machine learning based digital twin, which is a useful tool for network uh, KPI prediction and what if analysis. To build a ML uh, based with digital twin, it's necessary to have good training data. Obtaining such a data set is very hard. Data from real networks is often limited due to telemetry costs or privacy consideration. In addition, collected data will always miss important edge cases. From other hand, using simulated data is very difficult because simulators are slow to emulate large networks. Choosing a compact simulated data set will lead to a modern performance gains and will save training costs. Uh, the goal of our challenge is to understand how to produce a good training data set for a given GNN model. In this challenge, we are given a simulator and a GNN model and are asked to produce the best training data set possible. However, in, old, in order to address simulation speed and data scale issues, the organizers set a couple of constraints. Namely, the data set should be small, up to 100 samples, and each sample can represent only a small network, up to 100 nodes. While the validation and, and test data sets include large networks of up to 300 nodes. So the challenge from ML perspective is twofold. The training and test data are very different and the training budget is very limited. This is the outline of our solution. The main idea is that, is that if we have a model that is well trained on small network samples, we can use it to select a set of 100 samples for the rapid training. We call such a well-trained model an oracle. We find a unique solution to represent the network as a single vector, which can be used for clustering of networks of different topologies. We combine embeddings from two oracle models to create the optimal vector representation for all samples. These embeddings are then used for clustering and choosing the most important samples for training. Our fully automatic algorithm is able to reduce the sample pool from 270,000 Samples to only 500.
Uh, in summary, I would like to highlight the contribution of our approach. Firstly, we developed an overall fully automatic pipeline for optimal data selection in the networking domain. Secondly, we developed novel embedding scheme for representing different network configurations and topologies. And lastly, we combined several, several Oracle models to get the best clustering solution. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Team Grostax. I'd like to next call for Team MLAP. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm Sai Krishna representing team MLAP here to present our solution of power amplifier behavior modeling using machine learning. Uh, in wireless communication systems, uh, the transmitted signal gets attenuated over the channel. Um, also, this is represented as path loss. So to overcome the path loss, like we boost the signal at the transmitter using power amplifiers so that uh, the signal reaches the receiver overcoming the path loss. But uh, ideally we want the power amplifier to boost the signal linearly, whereas uh, in real time, uh, there is some non-linearity introduced by the power amplifier, especially when operated at higher power. Uh, this non-linearity actually affects the signal quality and also causes inter-channel interference. So understanding the power amplifier and its behavior is uh, very critical uh, to improve the efficiency of the overall wireless communication systems in general. So the problem here is to uh, effectively estimate the output of the power amplifier given an input sequence. Now, this is a very well explored problem in literature using mathematical modeling and of late like people have shown enough interest in extending it onto machine learning or deep learning solutions as well. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, bridge between both the solutions. Like here we use deep learning models, also taking into consideration um, the very most commonly used uh, conventional algorithm, namely memory polynomial, uh, because the majority of features that that memory polynomial model shows to be really valid or relevant to effectively estimate the power amplifier output. So instead of seeing the deep learning model as a black box, like we tried to get inspired by a conventional algorithm and designed our architecture based on it. Um, in, in the sense, like the major features will be the signal and it's the product of the signal and its uh, um, magnitude powers. So that forms the input layer. And based on the other things, we have separate subnetworks, which actually uh, relate to how this equation is generated, but giving more provisions to the assumptions that we make while creating any of the conventional approaches. So this is a step above conventional approaches, but at the same time, retaining majority of the uh, values that were obtained using conventional approaches. The major advantages of using such a network is we can provide the priority based on the chronology of the samples. That is like for the current sample, which will have, uh, which will aid more to the output will be, can be given more, much more priority than the very past samples. That is uh, very old samples in terms of memory. And then we can learn more nonlinearity also using uh, the deep learning approaches uh, with nonlinear activation functions in, in between. So, and hence, like here we have uh, more provisions to provide more importance to the current sample than the past, and also lower complexity network. The various hyperparameters used for uh, this network are here, and more details of these can be seen in the GitHub link for this particular problem statement. Now, moving on to the so results, for like your time um, is up. So, could you please wrap up yeah. in the next 10 seconds? Yeah, please? just just another 10 seconds here. Yeah. So, we observed an improvement of around 7 dB in both NMSC and SEPR using this approach. Uh, and the organizers have given uh, almost uh, equal weightage to the NMSC, SEPR, and the computational complexity. And our solution was the best according to the organizers. And uh, why PA modeling is important because here we can understand the PA nonlinearity more effectively. Your and then, time is up. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. I'd like to next call for Team Inovnet. 
Mm, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Start your presentation. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so my screen is visible? Yes. Okay. Okay, here's Tarek Muhammad from Team Nullnet. Okay, uh, and we are discovering a new era of AI by uh, of AI and by uh, predicting new links and new use cases. Uh, here's the team. Uh, we have uh, the mentor, Dr. Vishnu, and we have uh, me as uh, the only one uh, team member. Okay. Okay, uh, why it's important to discover new era of uh, AI? Okay, because we have in 5G, uh, we have a lot of use cases, and this a lot of use cases. Uh, adds more complexity to the network, which adds more new use cases. And these new use cases equally, uh, actually for, for any uh, business equals the revenue, okay? So uh, when, it, when it comes to, to use cases, uh, what it takes now to, uh, to predict new use cases, we have the current use, use cases. This is monitored by the experts and the experts uh, detect new use cases, but we have a problem of time and we have a concern of efforts uh, exerted to have new use cases. Okay, what is the solution for this? Okay, now we have the current use cases, but now this current use cases is fed into an AI model. Okay, this AI model, uh, which predicts the new use cases itself. We don't have the, the, the expert to uh, manage and to, um, uh, and to uh, predict uh, the use case itself because the AI, the AI model uh, do this job for, for us, okay? So uh, what, what we have done for this, uh, we have done a fully automated model. Uh, this uh, pipeline is a fully automated. If we, if we have uh, parsed the documents very well, and also if we have uh, making uh, or automated the uh, graph database representation, so we have a, a fully automated. So we, uh, we minimize the efforts and time. Uh, second thing, we, we reached uh, an 80% link uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, like uh, th this makes us um, more more sure about uh, new use cases or new links predicted from our uh, from our model, and also we have predicted new uh, more than six thousand and five hundred new links prediction predicted uh, links. This links um, maybe presenting uh, they uh, present the, um, the the new potentials for AN in our uh, in our network. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, this is the reference for our uh, work. This is the GitHub people and the full report. And thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to next call for team Tele AI Lab to start their presentation, please. Okay. Can I see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Good day, everyone. I'm Minjie from Team Tele AI Lab. It's my great honor to present our implementation of multitask learning on the ISSI-based location estimation. In a problem, the positions of four access points are given, and the, along with a bunch of points for the training points, both ISSI and the positions are given. The task is to the task is to estimate the locations of the verification points based on the given ISSIs, and additionally. In, uh, environmental information loss and, and loss are also given. And our solution based on the multitask learning, and we compare, um, we compare our solution to the three models. We know that three model returns only one estimation, either latitude or long, longitude. However, in our model, we can estimate latitude and longitude in one single model by extracting the well-studied RSSI distance relationships so a shared layer to improve the performance. <clears throat> the result turned out that our solution outperforms out, out on the mean error. However, the maximum error grows. We investigate the distribution of the errors. It's grew to the small error, small value zoom, which, turned, which shows the potential of the solution. And in real applications, we have actually realized that location-based service based on the MDT data. And we, are, we then consider to combine both indoor and outdoor positioning to, to reach the goal to support the integrated sensing and communication. And thank you. That's all for my report. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to call next for Team TII. Hello, oh, can you see my screen? 
Not yet. We can see it now. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's my honor to um, present in Team TII. Uh, I'll work on the multi model deep learning for sensing assistive communications. Um, so, why is sensing for communication important? Because beyond 5G, um, it gives a higher frequency in narrow beams and to boost the capacity and improve performance. But it has a challenge in the mobility beam management, especially uh, we have a high propagation loss and uh, mobility. So uh, in this challenge, we tackle this sens sensing assisted beam prediction problem. So um, we use some multimodality sensors, including the camera, LiDAR, radar, and GPS data in, in different time sequences. Uh, we develop the ML model to do, to um, to predict the best beam for the target users. Uh, traditionally, GPS may give you a higher um, uh, um, accurate um, location, but it has the problem of the latency energy. So, and the sensors can give more uh, environmental information. So our solutions um, develop a multimodal transformer um, model that uh, we first extract the features of different modality data um, and the transfer can be used to transfer for a portrait model. And uh, we do the projection and from uh, 2D, so it can align the dimensions of different uh, uh, sensor data. And we use a transformer to fuse the uh, features and on the sensor spaces, uh, each of the feature uh, uh, dimension. And then general, it can be generalized to different applications, and not only for this being prediction, and also flexible uh, of the input. So you can use one or two or multiple modality, which is highly flexible. Uh, this model is especially generalized to uh, multimodal deep learning. And uh, we also developed uh, the data preprocessing on each of the sensory for image, uh, like in do some enhancements. Uh, for Plan Cloud, we project from 3D to 2D and customizing the view uh, according to the image. And then for radar, we do a Fourier transform to the range angle and velocity maps. And GPS, we do normalization and calibrate the view angles. So um, comparing all these resources, we find that uh, with multiple sequences of data, it improves a lot of the performance than uh, with uh, a few uh, time sequences. And also our pre-processing technique is very helpful. And uh, with multiple modality, we prove that it's much um, better accuracy than with using less uh, modality. And also our transform model is much more powerful. And so the benefits um, from our conclusion, we do a transformer and then we propose pre-process the data and then generalize the different scenario applications. Advantage, our model is very terrible and robust and di diverse to different applications as well. For example, we can do other beam prediction, mobility management, can do sensor localization, or even controlling the vehicles and the traffic. So that's um, a presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. And last but not least, I would like to call for Team Snowy Owl to make their presentation. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. First, could um, TI please? Yeah, thank you. Hold on a second. Just... Um, okay. Can you see my can you see my slides correctly? Yes. Okay. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shabu Dawal. We're presenting on behalf of Team Snowy Owl. So to get let's get started. So traditionally in a machine a machine learning learning project, a lot of attention is is given to the elaboration of the models, usually establishing new new layers, putting on more and more layers of hyperparameter tuning, usually leading to bigger and bigger models. Usually there is less attention is given to the data. Uh, we, do, we focus mostly on getting more and more, but the quality of the data is also important. And uh, these data-centric AI approach in, in particular seeks to do more with less. This can have advantages in terms of training time and cost to acquire data, as well as savings in terms of energy uh, by lowering the reliance on bigger energy models. So the problem statement for the, uh, for the GNN challenge 2022 was that in, instead of uh, having to elaborate the model, we are given a model and we have to give it a data set, a data set with several restrictions and, uh, and have the, the model have, have the best results with it. So the constraints for the data sets is limited to 100 unique samples of a small uh, with a graph data set of 10, of 10 nodes per graph maximum. And it has to scale up to larger graphs, 50 to 300 nodes. We are evaluated on mean absolute percentage error. 
So our solution, so for our solution, we've elaborated the following three-step process. We, we divide into, uh, into the into initial data set generation, data set refactoring, and data set cleaning. So for the first and initial data set generation, we, we, we look at the target domain and essentially try to match the uh, size and variant parameter parameters, or at least those that are invariant topology. So for example, like for example, the scheduling policy in the buffer. So next, after that, in order to, to get to get the size, the size dependent parameters right, we, we, we extrapolate them from the size and variant parameters, or what we'll see. And finally, once we generate our data set, we go through a set of data cleaning, usually using the understanding of the model to remove, uh, to remove samples that may negatively affect performance. So for data set refactoring, for example, the link capacity tends to depend heavily on the size of the topology. So in order to get it, we look at the link utilization, which is a normalized value between zero and 100. And we, and we um, infer the capacity backwards from this using also the total number of flows. We also ensure we, ha we have a, a large variety of uh, different topologies in our data set in order to cover all possible use cases. So finally, these are, uh, these were our results on uh, our approach, and we managed to lower the make from the initial thirty-three or so percent down to six, down to six percent on validation and eight point five percent on our final test set. To note, the um, the model when trained on thousands of samples gives a make of about five percent, so we've gotten really close with a small fraction of the data. So in conclusion, our contribution is we elaborate our process in order to engineer creation of much smaller data set by looking at the by by looking at the target domain. And it, and it really emphasizes the importance of data quality since our results were achieved with about 90 samples, which wasn't even the full allotment that we are allowed. And it, uh, we, in conclusion, we like data centric AI merits greater attention as it can allow for savings in terms of, in term, in terms of energy costs and more energy in more energy conscious world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. That's it for the presentations. Thank you everyone who um, presented today. I'd like to now start on our public poll. Um, just before we show our screen, the public poll session will go on for five minutes. Um, you will be able to vote for the top three teams, so please make sure to put or choose three teams that you think did the best presentations, but please make sure to only send in your vote once. Um, Jinu, can I ask you to show the QR code and the link, please? Thank you. So, Please start voting. I invite everyone who is watching the session today to vote. Um, just to quickly recap, we first had XDDing for the problem statement classification of home network users to improve user experience. We then had Euclid for the problem statement federated traffic prediction for 5G and beyond. And then we had Avatar for multimodal beam prediction challenge. We then had MLab NFP for network failure prediction on CNS 5GC with Linux EBF, AA Vision, site and video slide transition detection and title extraction in lecture videos. We then had Digital Twins for the challenge Build Your Own Closed Loop. Then we had 6G ISAC for a depth math estimation in 6G millimeter wave systems. We then had Ghost Ducks for the Graph Neural Networking Challenge. And we had MLIP, non-linear power and prior behavior modeling to achieve higher energy efficiency in 5G RAN. We then had InnovNet for build your own closed loop. Then we had TeleAI Lab for location estimation using RSSI, wireless LAN, and LS and MOS environment. We then had TII for multimodal beam prediction challenge. And then last but not least, we had Snowy Owl for graph neural networking challenge 2022. So again, please make sure to vote for the top three teams that you think had the best um, presentations. Um, for everyone on the neural network, the URL for the poll should be in the chat and on YouTube as well, the link should be in the chat as well, so or in the comment section. So if you're watching through YouTube, you should be able to vote from there as well. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, I can take them now. So please um, put in anything you'd like in the chat and we'll take them now. Otherwise, um, well, this year, uh, especially this year, ITU provided compute resources for everyone who wanted access to better GPUs. I believe that Team XDDing, uh, you used the 
resources this year. I'd like to just ask about, or do you have maybe a few words to say about your experience using the, the resources? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think it helped out a lot for develop, developing my solution. And yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so I hope, uh, I'm happy to hear that it was useful. Well, we are halfway through the polls. We have about two minutes and a half left. So if you have not voted yet, please make sure to vote. Um, during this time, I'd like to reintroduce um, the special issue of the ITU journal. So I know Thomas has already introduced it, but just to recap for everyone who might have missed it, um, the full name of the ITU journal is called ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. So the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies is an international journal that provides a holistic coverage on all communication and network paradigms. It is a peer-reviewed journal, and each year after the AI and 5G challenge has concluded, we have a special issue where participants can submit papers on their challenge solutions. Um, and these are actually reviewed by experts in the field. So in 2020, we had an expert from the China Mobile Research Institute as a lead guest editor. And then in 2021, we had someone from the Federal University of Para from Brazil. And for the special issue resulting from this year's challenge, we will have Professor Ahmed from Arizona State University, who has kindly agreed to be our lead guest editor this year. So please make sure to keep an eye out for the call for paper for this special issue. Um, participants as well, please, sure to make, uh, please make sure to send in your papers. And everyone listening, please make sure to keep an eye out for this special issue as well. And you can read up on all the challenge solutions in detail uh, through the journal. We will also be having a few words from Professor Hagmid later on. So, or right after this actually, so we'll be looking forward to hearing from him as well. Um, just to recap in the last 40 seconds or so of the poll, uh, just our program right after this, we're going to have a few words from um, some of the hosts of the 2022 challenge. We will then have an outlook for the challenge by um, one of the of, of, from Vishnu. And then we will have a featured talk by a distinguished guest. And then we will be going into our awards announcements. So please make sure to keep or stay on, stay connected until the very end. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up on the poll now. The results should be announced after soon. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to now invite some of the hosts of the 2022 challenge to make some so to say a few words, can I first invite Professor Ahmed, if you're ready? Hello. Thank Hello, you. everyone. Thank you. Uh, so thanks everyone again for uh, for, uh, for for joining us today, and thanks uh, Maya, uh, Thomas, and Vishnu for 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 all the efforts in organizing um, uh, these great competitions. And I think uh, this this really helps in advancing um, the community, the, this this all this machine learning uh, research and wireless communication, and uh, giving it more and more um, visibility and and uh, momentum. Uh, so for for uh, for this year, uh, we organized uh, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, with ITU um, one one competition and for for deep sense. Uh, ITU multimodal beam prediction, and the motivation for this competition started with uh, increasing potential of using multimodal sensing, such as position, visual uh, data, lidar, radar, uh, etc., to provide uh, information about the geometry, position, uh, orientation, uh, shapes, and uh, mobility patterns, and so on of the mobile users and uh, and different elements in the environment, scatters, and so on. And in conclusion, provide some sort of awareness and perception uh, for the network that can uh, help it to make decisions on uh, all the way from physical layer decisions on channel subspace prediction, beam prediction, uh, um, beam learning, good book learning, and so on, all the way to access and uh, uh, beam management 
uh, blockage prediction handoff, and all the way to uh, network and application uh, layer actually decisions as well. Uh, so this year in particular, we started with uh, one focus on beam prediction. So using this multimodal sensing data from position, LIDAR, radar, visual data to, uh, uh, to, to, to basically, uh, we try to ask the question, can the network, say a base station, use this data to uh, know where to point the beam out of a certain uh, code book and to serve the user. Um, and in particular, what we try to focus on is uh, design, uh, designing and, and, and building a data set that is uh, very realistic. So we had data from collect real world data collected from four different locations um, uh, with sufficiently large uh, uh, number of, of samples and variants. Uh, very realistic situations of many vehicles moving, pedestrians, bi bikes, and so on. Um, and uh, the point there is that if we can design an efficient machine learning model or, or a solution that can uh, really use the, this multimodal sensing to make good predictions of, of beam management, it's a very challenging problem in, 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 in millimeter wave and then in the future towards uh, subterrors. Then this, uh, you know, like will make a big, a step towards making this uh, this idea re a reality. So we can actually end up with systems in the future uh, that can deploy and employ all these different uh, sensors to make decisions and then reduce the overhead on the actual wireless communication systems. Um, so that was the data set we, uh, and the, 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 the competition uh, uh, was designed around the data set and around this, this, this problem. And uh, we're very impressed with uh, great results uh, of the of the, uh, the it's not just the three teams, but actually the, the five or seven top teams uh, in the competition, and in particular congrat congratulations to the top three winners, um, uh, who showed really um, uh, very impressive uh, results. And uh, and as a result, I think like the, 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 this again confirms and 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 shows the potential of using this multimodal sensing to solve this key problem in wireless communication systems. Uh, and there is a, still uh, a very good room for improvement, uh, which is why we also now moved this machine learning competition and deep sense into a, a general task. So if if any uh, of you is interested in further part participating in this machine learning task of multimodal sensing aided beam prediction, you can still participate, access the data set and participate in this uh, task uh, uh, in the DeepSense website. So you can uh, submit your results and 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 be included in the leaderboard uh, table. So, um, so with that, I would like to, uh, uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank uh, uh, Thomas Vishnu, Vishnu and um, uh, ITU uh, for, for their great uh, uh, collaboration in, in organizing this competition. Also would like to uh, thank my co-organizers co -organizers in the competition, my students at ASU and my uh, collaborators in Qualcomm. And also thank Qualcomm and ITU for, um, for sponsoring uh, this competition. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to organizing more competitions actually in around deep sense uh, in the next year um, uh, with ITU as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to next call for Leah from ZTE. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I can uh, see for, you. For him. Uh, sorry. Can you see me can now? See you. Um, no, not really. Uh, we can it's see okay, your can background. OK. Yeah. Okay. I, I I don't know what what's wrong with with, with it. Yeah. Uh. So, so, sorry for this problem. And thank you so much for having me here. And I'm Leah Yuan from ZTE Corporation, and I'm very honored to be here for the grand final. And this is actually the uh third year for ITU AI ML in 5G challenge. And also it is the third year that ZTE joined as the host of the problem statements. Uh, we have two problem statements this year. And 
the first one is nonlinear power uh, amplifier behavior modeling to achieve higher energy uh, efficiency in 5G RAN. And the second is classification of network user to improve user experience. So uh, all we are trying to do is to uh, uh, make, make the network more efficient and make the experience of the users better. And I think this is a great and uh, uh, very nice uh, open platform that people from all over the world can join together and work on the problem statements from both industry like us and uh, from uh, the academy side. Uh, actually, it's a really a great opportunity for us to be a part of it, and we are so glad to have witnessed so many uh, great and inspiring AI solutions coming out in these years, and some of them can really make the uh, network more intelligent uh, from dis uh, different perspectives. Uh, innovation and perseverance can always win out during a competition. And one gives you a fantastic idea and the other makes the idea become true. I believe these are what bring uh, all, all the uh, uh, presenters here today. And thank you uh, very much for your great presentation. And I wish all of you can get the prizes and uh, 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 that deserve your hard work in the past few months. And I think this challenge is just a start and there are still many challenges out there for us to explore when it comes to applying AI in 5G network. Uh, hope you are all set for them. And that's all from my side. And uh, lastly, uh, still, I want to thank you, uh, ITU AI for good. Uh, thank, thank you, AI in 5G challenge um, for this great uh, collaboration opportunity. And thank you for your great performance for your presentation and good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I'd like to ask, or I'd like to invite Frank to make a few words as well. Hello. Hi, good afternoon from Germany. It's a bit cold here, but <laughs> yeah, we're fine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of, of, of having a say here today. Uh, basically, uh, together with colleagues at CTTC, I organized the problem statement on federated traffic plus uh, prediction. And what I can say from, from the point of view of, of a problem statement host, basically is that the challenge is always an extremely nurturing experience for, for us in, in academia, also for industry. And we benefit a lot from, from it. Uh, basically, with this edition as Lydia, uh, I participated for the third time uh, by providing a problem statement. And I can say that every single year we have had amazing participants with very clever solutions, uh, which is super positive. And yeah, and the best of that is that regardless of the background of participants, which from my, also my own experience is typically, uh, participants, they are typically in computer science or AI instead of communications. But uh, despite this, they, they manage very well to, to get the ownership of the, of the problem. They understand it very well. They study it with a lot of detail. And most importantly, they provide valuable insights based on the data. So, this is the, the beauty of the challenge, no? that this unbiased vision of, of problems in communications is something really appealing and which makes this challenge unique, I would say, and little by little uh, a reference in the world on AI challenges. And yeah, with that said, uh, congratulations to, to all the participants. Uh, of course, congratulations to the winners and a special mention to the organization for all this massive infrastructure. Uh, I liked a lot how Mija is, is leading the, the, the sessions, he's conducting this. And of course, uh, Thomas, Vishnu, Reinhardt, they always do a, an amazing job on, on this. So thank you all and, and see you soon.
Thank you very much for your lovely words. I'd like to now invite Vishnu to say a few words on the 2022 outlook for the challenge. All right. Thanks, thanks, Mia. And let me get my crystal ball. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, my name is Vishnu. I'm here to give you a, a quick uh, outlook on 2023. Uh, let's see where we stand. Uh, so, last year, last year, we I was uh, putting on the hat of a storyteller. This year, I am a chronic question. So, so we will have a lot more questions from me. Okay, no, not many answers, but still, let's see where we go with the twenty twenty three. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, first question that the questioner would ask is where exactly is AI and my internet? You know. There is a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, advancements in AI ML in just in one year, uh, just in the last year between the last challenge and this one. If you see, you can see that uh, there is Chat GPT, and then there are lots of other uh, um, new innovations which has come in AI ML field itself. So where do we see all this going in the network? So we, you know, on the left side, we, I have put this traditional software flow, which looks at reporting a problem, fixing the bug, test and this is a typical software flow, right? Uh, but from there, we see it going towards uh, AI native workflow, where you discover problems, find and retrain models which can solve those problems, and then test and deploy those models. So this is where we see the transition going in the network. And of course, we are ready, <laughs> night to you, we are ready. We have this uh, 3172, uh, that is a recommendation from ITU. And that is linked to this 3176 marketplaces recommendation. And that uh, we see that you, you see these bugs and those bugs are actually fixed by these models and these pipelines. And then they are, those, those models are in this marketplace. That's how we see it. So in general, we see the outlook next year, we would like to see a large, large scale integration of multiple AI and non-based use cases. And that being a commonplace, and that's when the real fun part is ready to start. What would generative AI do for us or do to us, actually? <laughs> so, you know, uh, there is a lot of talk about generative AI. It's quite interesting. I can't, I can't open a social media now without seeing some output from some generative AI. <laughs> so that's quite interesting. But at the same time in the network, you know on the network side here on the left side, you see there is network, there is digital web. Okay, so that's how we look at it, that there is network and there is digital train of that. Now, uh, with the generative AI, we would think of it as uh, generating things for the digital train. So for example, you would look at scenarios, use cases, data, code coming from this generative AI into the digital train, which can be applied in the network. So here again, we are ready uh, at ITU. Uh, we have this 3172. In addition, we have this 3176 that I already told you about. And we have sandboxes, which is 3181 recommendation uh, that is a standard from ITUT. Uh, so in terms of outlook, we would look at generate, validate new data, code, scenarios, and of course, comes problems along with it, right? So yeah, we will see how that goes. What exactly is training data? So so you know what is training data, but but this is what you see on the left side. You see this training data, as you already know. There is data, there is training and testing split, and then there are models which come out of it. That that's that's the usual story, right? But 
we look at it in terms of knowledge bases, which contain some knowledge, and then that being used to train this model. And that's what you see here as things go forward. A bit of it is already come. I mean, you, you would have seen the papers. If you look at the papers which are published now, you can see that this kind of a transition is already happening. And that is learning models are learning. And, and Frank just now, Frank just now talked about federated ML and um, Ahmed talked about uh, fusion models. This all brings us to this concept of knowledge bases and how to train models from knowledge bases. So here again, we are ready. So we have this uh, knowledge base, which is introduced as part of focus group autonomous networks uh, specification, set technical specification which I have shown here. In addition to whatever I talked about. So in Outlook for next year, we would think of model training and tuning from knowledge bases and experiments. Uh, a lot more of that, you would see that coming in the next year problem statements, hopefully. Whose model are we talking about here? So uh, there, is a, there is a quote from uh, the GitHub CEO. Uh, it's a very famous quote. <laughs> so you can, uh, he says that the software ate the world already, and now AI is going to eat the world. Now, if you, if you look at his role in GitHub, and if you look at how it is, it is applied, you already know that GitHub is about open source code, and that is applied in the network already. The way we look at it in terms of transitions is that you have these model hubs and you have local data, which is, which is used for retraining and customizing, tuning, fine tuning these model models from the model hubs. And that is applied to the network. So that's this new flow which we are thinking about here. And that, if you see, if you see the parallels, it's very clear where things are going. And you, uh, I would suggest you carefully listen to uh, the next speaker, Mr. Park, who will talk about some of these aspects in terms of applying CI/CD pipelines uh, uh, in terms of training uh, models. So here we would do slight adjustments in the sense that we have local knowledge base. We have 3176 and 3181, as I already talked to you about but the knowledge base being local is applied to this model. And we would look at commoditized open source models, just like we see code right now. So it's almost Christmas time, right? So I, I am eligible for, for a few wishes, right? So, so what is our wish list for 2023? We look at bringing large scale integration of multiple AI ML based use cases, but at the same time, how do we do this? We, we need increased reach and your help in terms of mentors. In fact, I would, I would strongly suggest the teams who, who presented just now to also look at how, how you can play a role in, uh, in getting new people, in, mentoring new people. In. So we would like your help and support in terms of increasing our reach and getting this integrated approach to AI. Huh? Putting AI to work ourselves. So it's not only the competitors, it's not only the participants, teams who are having all the fun. We would like to have some fun too. So we would put AI to work, generate, validate new code, new scenarios, new data. We would uh, also look at creating a sandbox, model training, tuning, knowledge bases, as I told you about. And reference model hubs, it's not only hugging pace, right? We, we would have reference model hubs, open source models in model hubs. This is exactly similar to the compute that, uh, that we opened up this year, free of cost. So, right, so that's, that's, the, that's our wish list for next year, uh, as usual. Let's see where it goes and uh, let's hope things go well. Uh, we need all your support. Uh, we, uh, we would like to march forward on this path of uh, providing quality challenges where we, we welcome these new teams, new, new uh, participants. We would like to enhance our reach, create awareness of these technologies, applying these to the, the, uh, to the network. 
in terms of utilizing our recommendations and technical specifications for my TV. So with that, I will hand it back to uh, Mia and uh, wish you all the best. See you next year. Back to you, Mia. Thank you very much for your lovely presentation and thank you so much for the excellent work that you've done over the years for the AI and 5G challenge. Now, it is with my great pleasure that I welcome our speaker for today's featured talk, Chanson Park. Um, Chanson Park received his bachelor's degree in computer engineering from India University in Korea. He's been with ETRI, the Electronics and Telecommunication Research Institute, as a researcher since 2020. And he's also been a Google developer expert for machine learning and the Google Cloud platform. Over to you, Chanson. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. So hello, everyone. My name is Chen Song Park from South Korea. Nice to meet you all. I'll feel very honored to give a presentation at ITU AIML and 5G Grand Challenge Finale. In this feature talk, I'm going to discuss about automated segment a semantic segmentation, machine learning pipeline from data to a fully working application. It is an opinionated approach to machine learning operations, but it is not task specific, even though I put semantic segmentation in the title. So I hope my talk could be helpful for many of you attending this meetup. So let's get started. First off, let me introduce a bit of myself. Currently, I'm a network researcher at Electronics Telecommunications Research Institute in South Korea. I generally look for how to design a network and its control plane like software-defined network platforms. And my recent focus is about bringing intelligence in passive optical network with network slicing capabilities. In order to become fluent in machine learning in terms of modeling and operational scenarios, I have spent two years with the roles of Google developers experts and Hugging Face fellow. Within these communities, I'm focusing on democratizing machine learning operations by writing in-depth blog posts and open source projects. So today's talk is also about machine learning operations or MLOps. Let's take a look at what topics will be covered in detail. In the first section of the talk, general concepts will be covered, such as machine learning operations and the importance of building prototype applications before going production. Then in the second section of this talk, let's take a quick look at an example project that I have recently worked on to realize one aspect of machine learning operations with the GitHub Actions, TensorFlow, TensorFlow Extended, Google Cloud Technologies, and Hugging Face Hub. First thing first, what is machine learning operations? We often claim that we got a state-of-the-art image classification or natural language processing models. However, there's no universally best model. The best model you get is almost always an optimal model from a snapshot of a certain period of time. So when the timeline moves... Tenson, could you please check your slides are moving? Uh, my slide? Yeah, it's uh, moving now. Yeah. Uh, oh, do you see my some? What do you see? Fashions keep changing over time. Yeah, that's that. That, that is the one. So, ah, cool. Thanks. Okay, so, so the snapshot is not the optimal snapshot anymore. As you see from the slide, we can clearly see that fashion trend has been changed over time, and we know it from our actual experiences. So even if you get the best model to recognize clothes in 2010 to 2019 period, it's hardly possible that it won't be the best model in the near future. Um, we can see similar phenomenon from the languages that we use in our daily life. Our children don't know the language from our teenage, and we don't know their languages too. And as you might notice from time to time, you often see some new slang or expressions from SNS or internet. If you don't know, and if your model was trained in your age, your model doesn't know them either. This kind of situation is often cited as data drift or concept drift. Machine learning model is like a black box and we don't know when the performance degradation occurs. Like we can insert if and else statement for exception handling inside of the model. And that is why our changes to the model is called silent killer. So instead, what we need is monitoring capabilities, meaning monitoring and evaluating the model performance 
periodically by giving a newly collected data set that the model has never seen from the training phase. Basically, there are two common situations when the machine learning system has to evolve over time. First, the machine learning system has to evolve according to the changes in data. Second, the machine learning system has to evolve according to the changes in code base. That means we get better technologies over time. For instance, we witness data preprocessing or data engineering strategies and modeling strategies change so quickly in these days. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I don't think your slides are changing. We're still seeing the um, fashions keep changing over time slide. Oh, sorry. What's that? Right now it's on the silent killer, skew and drift. Oh, okay, see. Um, uh, do you see the slide moves? Oh, yep, yeah, it's moving now, yeah. Okay, sorry. Sorry for that, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so the second, the machine learning system has to evolve according to the changes in code base. That means we get, we get better technologies over time. For instance, we witness data pre-processing or data engineering strategies and modeling strategies changes so quickly in these days. The difference to DevOps world is that a new model born out of new technologies should be evaluated before going production. Um, according to the detected data drift or model performance decay, we build a model, a new model with more data or better algorithm that could be systematically determined by looking at some of the metrics so we could automate the process. However, it is still important, build, important to build demo applications with a currently trained model. Let's see why. The thing is that uh, even though we got a better loss, accuracy, or whatever the metrics are, we can not easily say the model is ready to be deployed or replace the old one. As you know, machine learning model works pretty well on training data set, and it could even show a good performance on test data set as well. However, deployed machine learning model deals with really unseen data. Actually, we cannot predict what kind of input data the end users are going to input. You know, users always use applications in unpredictable ways. So it is probably a good idea to prototype an application to let users try out before going production. After monitoring and after getting feedback from the users, we might be able to rethink where our goal should be heading to. In the, in the past few months, me and my colleague have ported SEG former model into TensorFlow with Hugging Face Transformers, and the result looked great on the benchmark data set. Then I tried the model in different images from the Google search. At this time, the result was not good at all. I might have tried real different images from the distribution of the training data set, but there's still something we need to find out. So in my opinion, before the model deployment to the production environment, first, we need to let the world use it with a pro prototype application. Second, we need to take positive and negative feedbacks from the users. Third, we need to reflect the feedbacks by fine tuning the models by collecting more data or better algorithms. So finally, let me introduce my recent work and to end semantic segmentation pipeline. Basically, it addresses the problems that I stated earlier. By running the pipeline, you can ensure the ensure that to be deployed model is always better than the old one or currently deployed one. Also, it automatically pushes and publishes a prototype application on hugging face spaces. This slide shows an overview of the project. First, project collaborators could launch an GitHub action on desired branches. So we could verify if the proposed pull requests are good to go. Second, the GitHub action eventually run the pipeline on Vertex AI pipeline. Which is, which is a fully managed AI platform provided by Google Cloud Platform. Third, inside the Vertex AI pipeline, all the components are run sequentially from data ingestion to deployment. The entire pipeline is written in TensorFlow Extended Framework and it fits well to Vertex AI. Fourth, when the pipeline ends running, it pushes the survive or blast the model to external model registry and create a prototype application with Hugging Face Hub. Here, BLAST model means that the model shows a performance above not only the baseline threshold, but also the model pushed last time. Let's take a bit more details on each step. 
The project shows a good use case of leveraging GitHub action, especially for collaborative MLOps projects. Any collaborators could run the pipeline of a designated branch with their own GCP project ID. Any collaborators could run the pipeline of the desk. Uh, uh, with, okay. Also, some of the components of the pipeline could be conditionally run with more specialized services. There are four parameters to control the GitHub action. First, when you input your GCP project ID, it looks for its credentials, matching to the key in GitHub's action secrets. Second, you can decide which region you want to run the pipeline on GCP. This is a required parameter to run the pipeline on Vertex AI pipeline. Um, third, you could specify which pipeline to run. Basically, you can have as many pipelines as possible in a system, even though the, this project only has one pipeline. But specifying the pipeline is still needed, and it gives a flexibility for others to fork this repository for other purposes. Lastly, you could set true or false parameter to enable job delegation. Google Cloud Platform offers specialized data flow service for data processing which is Google's port solution to a touch beam. By setting this parameter true, the jobs of components involved into data processing will be delegated to Dataflow. Finally, when you hit run workflow button on the bottom side, the GitHub action is triggered. And it basically do the five things in a row. As the first step, it installs the required dependencies of TFX, KFP, uh, or Qflow pipeline and Hugging Face Hub library. The dependencies in the first step are installed only for check the validity of the pipeline within the VM of the GitHub action. As the next step, it replaces some sensitive information with the GitHub action secrets. For instance, in order to access Hugging Face Hub with writable authority, we need Hugging Face Hub access token. And the token is stored in GitHub action secret, then it will replace placeholders in the configuration files. The third step is to install GCP SDK and authenticate GCP with your own credentials. The first step creates and compile the pipeline with easy to use TFX CLIs. With TFX CLIs, you could easily build a Docker image and push it to the Docker re image registry. Then all the components will be run based on the newly built Docker image. In the last step, you simply run the pipeline on Vertex AI pipeline. Now let's take a look what happens in the Vertex AI, AI pipeline. Vertex AI pipeline is basically an implementation of Qflow version 2.2.x. So you could actually run the pipeline on premise servers if you have Qflow 2.x installed. However, it is worth noting that the Vertex AI pipeline is a serverless platform. That means you pay for only how much you used it. You don't need to have Kubernetes and Qflow up and running 24 seven. Within the Vertex AI pipeline, the components defined with TFX run sequentially. We'll have a look at the TFX pipeline itself in a bit, but let's talk about the job delegation in this slide. In deep learning, we often deal with a large amount of data that, can, that can't be handled in a single machine. And also we often deal with a large model that is hard to be trained on a single GPU. So depending on your situation, you might want to have a distributed cluster or system, which is specialized to data pro processing or model training or model deployment. GCP offers two services for such situation. As, man as mentioned earlier, Dataflow is a Google's compatible solution to Apache Beam, which is well known to handle a large amount of data processing efficiently. Also, you can attach GPUs if needed. Vertex AI is a really uh, all-in-one solution, AI solution. As you have seen, it provides Vertex AI pipeline, but at the same time, it provides Vertex AI training and endpoint. With the Vertex AI training, you could train a model with a cluster of servers equipped with multiple GPUs. And with the Vertex AI endpoint, you could deploy a model and create an endpoint, and the number of servers are all scaled in and out based on the resources utilization. In order to leverage Dataflow and Vertex AI with TensorFlow Extended, all you need to do is to specify appropriate configurations in the appropriate component. For instance, this slide shows an example configuration for the Dataflow service. What you need to focus is the maximum number of workers and machine times, which basically lets you configure the server clusters. 
Also, it is worth noting that the configuration is passed in with beam pipeline args method of the component. Whenever you see a component built on top of a patch beam, you could delegate the job to the data flow in the same manner. There are two most common components using data flow. One is the example gen, which ingest, shuffle, split the raw data. And the other one is the transform, which pre-processes the data. This slide shows how you can delegate training job to Vertex AI training in the model in the modeling code, specify which dis distributed strategy to use. Then all you need to do is to inject a dictionary to the trainer component describing how you would want to use Vertex AI training. As an example, take a look at the codes on the right-hand side. You can notice that worker pull specs under the training R key specify which type of VM, how many VMs, which type of GPU, how many GPUs are needed for the trainer component. Also, when serving a machine learning model, the nodes or pods should be scaled in and out depending on the amount of traffic so that we don't harm the user experience. Vertex AI prediction combined with the Vertex AI endpoint can do exactly that. Similar to the Vertex AI training, all you need to do is to inject the dictionary to the pusher component describing how you would want to use Vertex AI prediction. As an example, take a look at the cause on the right-hand side under the serving arcs key is specific, specify the number of uh, maximum nodes to maintain, the number of maximum nodes to grow, and the number of nodes should grow based on the total CPU utilization across every nodes that are currently running, which GPU to use, how many GPUs that we need. Finally, we can also specify how you would like to split the incoming traffic. This feature is, is very useful when you have multi-models on the same endpoint. So that some traffic goes to the model A, some traffic goes to the model B. So let's do some sort of A-B testing, which is a common scenario in machine learning in production. Now it is time to uh, have a look uh, at the TFX pipeline itself. It consists of eight components in total. The pipeline starts with the example gen, which brings the data sources into the pipeline. And the data always flow in TF record format. TF record is a kind of standard way to define data sets in TensorFlow world. There are various versions of the example gen. For instance, if your original data is CSV format, then you could use CSV example gen. Or if your original data is from BigQuery, then you could use BigQuery example gen and so forth. As you might know, TF record serializes data in binary format, so it might be hard to parse all in that later steps. Instead, import schema gen allows us to define the shape of each features or tensors in the TF record. Then when the data is passed to the transform component along with import schema gen, the data is data is automatically shaped in proper forms. Then you could simply perform data pre-processing transform component before passing the data to trainer. Notice that while we could do some batch by batch data transformation, such as data augmentation in the trainer component, in the transform component, we usually do data pre-processing that could be applied to the whole data sets, such as normalization. In the trainer component, you could simply build a Keras-based model, train the model in the usual way by compiling and fitting to the data. For semantic segmentation tests, the model that I used here is the basic unit architecture. After, training, after the trainer completed the training, the model with the given data set, and outputs the trained model, but we still need to determine if the model is good enough to be deployed. That is the evaluator's job. The evaluator takes the trained model from the trainer component and the model that is currently deployed, which is the best model yet. Then when we give some configurations of evaluation metrics, the evaluator evaluates the trained model with the baseline threshold and the performance of the currently deployed model. When the trained model beats two criteria at minimum, it is determined as blast model, and it is passed to the downstream components. In this project, those downstream components are Hugging Face Pusher and Vertex Pusher. Hugging Face Pusher basically pushes the trained model to one of the repositories in Hugging Face Model Hub. A Hugging Face Model repository is built on top of Git large file system so any of the familiar Git commands could be used, or we could simply use Hugging Face 
how Python package for easier interactions. So what Hugging Face Pusher do in a bit detail is that it clones or creates a Hugging Face model repository. Then it creates a new branch with the name of the model version. That as then it as the trained model itself with the weights and some metadata, and finally commit and pushes it to the remote repository. As you see from the right hand side screenshot, different versions of the model are managed in different branches for easier segregation. Also, Hugging Face Pusher optionally pushes prototype application to one of the repositories uh, of a Hugging Face species. Hugging Face species consists of two components. One is the Git larger file system, just like the model repository. Second is the Docker build and run capabilities for Python applications. Currently supported Python application frameworks are Gradio and Streamlit. Hugging Face Pusher pushes the prototype application modules to the space repository and the Hugging Face space automatically builds on the application codes and displays the user interface. If you have an experience with Gradio and Streamlit, everything remains the same, except the model loading codes because the model should be always replaced with the blessed model or the best model at the point of the trained model is fully evaluated. So Hugging Face Pusher seeks some special tokens in the files inside the template modules, then it replaces them with the actual values at runtime. So I have reviewed some each pieces of the project from GitHub Action, continuous deployment of the machine learning pipeline, Vertex AI pipeline, specialized DCP services, TFX machine learning pipeline to, automa to automatic model versioning and the fully working prototype application. I don't have enough time to cover each piece in more detail, but I hope is this talk was helpful for some of you. So thank you for listening and don't forget to visit the repository of the project if you're interested in. Thank you. Oh, that was a rush. Thank you. Thank you very much for your featured talk. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have time to take questions today. Um, but thank you much. I'd like to now move on to our awards ceremony. Okay. So this year, uh, we ran 13 problem statements within the IT AI ML and 5G challenge. The problem statement winners were evaluated by hosts of the problem statements. In some cases, the host deemed there should be no winners for their respective problem statements. So the following three problem statements this year have no winners. So Gina, if I could ask you to share your screen. Thank you. So the three following statements, problem statements on the next slide. So the three problem statements, sliding videos, slide transition detection, throughput prediction, Wi-Fi networks, and IQ-based theme classification. These three problem statements will not have winners this year. So now we will show the following winners for problem statements that will receive a thousand source francs as prize money. We have Team Snowy Owl, Team Euclid, Team 6G Isaac, Team MLAP, Team Digital Twins, Data Rangers, Team The Big Fools, Team Tele AI Lab, Team Avatar, and finally Team CMRI AI Quants. Congratulations to all those teams. We will then have our honorable mentions. So the following teams have been awarded the Honorable Mentions Award. There is no prize money attached to this award, but the teams will receive a certificate. So, our Honorable Mentions. We have Ghost Up, MLIP, Digital Twins, MLab NFP, and TeleLab. Congratulations to those teams as well. And then we also have a public poll team. So, I think it's already on the screen now. We have Team Digital Twins. So this team will win 300 source ranks and a certificate as well. I'd like to next invite Chaser to award the final overall winners. Okay. So this is my turn now? Yes, it's your turn now. Yeah, uh, it's a really long journey, but now it's the time to announce the winners of the 
this third edition of the ITU AI Machine Learning Five Challenge. So this year we have several prize categories of awards. I'm happy to see that we have a special prize for students. This will encourage participants from the students to compete with the professionals in various program statements, as well as to know about ITU's standardization. In this category, there was competition and we decided to award two teams the student prize and each team will receive 300 Swiss francs and the certificate. The, the winners of the student prizes are Team Innovnet and the Team XDB. Congratulations to those teams, Innovnet and Team XDD. Okay, uh, I think that I have to continue. With this uh, upload uh, a little bit uh, excited. Next, we have the encouragement award. Encouragement award. Team will win 500 Swiss francs and the certificate as well. The winner of the encouragement award is Team AA Vision. AA Vision for encouragement award. Congratulations again. And next, we will go to the runners of category. Two teams are awarded the runners of. These teams will receive 500 Swiss francs at the certificate. The runners of are Team Euclid and the Team 6G ASA. Congratulations, Team Euclid and the Team 6G ASA. Now we are in the top three. Top three, the first bronze champion. Third place winner is Team TII. TII. This team will receive 1,000 Swiss points and the certificate. Move to the silver champion. Second place winner is Team Snow Yo. I hope I will correctly pronounce Snow Yo. This team will receive 2,000 Swiss points and the certificate. Now it's the time to announce the overall winner, the 2022 AI Machine Learning 5G Challenge Gold Champion. The first place winner is Team Abata. This team will receive 2,000 Swiss francs on the set. Congratulations to all winning teams. We will congratulate. Thank you, Mia. Thank you very much for announcing the winners. Thank you. Um, I'd like to then invite Team Avatar, so our winner for first place, to maybe say a few words. Oh, I don't think maybe Team Avatar is connected. Could I then ask um, our silver champion, Team Snowy Owl, to say a few words? Oh, sorry. Yeah, hello. Uh, I, I'm, uh, repre I'm representing Team Snowy uh, on behalf of Team Snowy Owl. I am uh, it's, I'm very I'm, uh, honored to receive, we're, we're all very honored to receive uh, the, this uh, uh, award and we, uh, very, 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 very much found the, uh, the challenge interesting, and uh, we're, we we would uh, pro, uh, we would very uh, have, we would heavily consider um, participating uh, again in the future. Um, so I didn't prepare a script, unfortunately, but um, uh, thank you again, uh, thank you again very much to all of the uh, presentations, and uh, it was uh, nice to uh, nice to meet, uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now ask or invite our director, Jason Lee, to, to say his closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Mia, again. Uh, so really excited uh, listening to this, uh, this uh, greetings of this. Uh, uh, I'm very, very happy with that. I uh, have to say thank you very much, everyone. 
And once again, congratulations to all teams that won various prizes and awards today. I'd also like to congratulate everyone who participated in this challenge. Uh, definitely, all we agreed, everyone is a winner. And the speed of the challenge organized by IQ is not only intended for participants to win prizes, but to gain skills about machine learning and the communication networks and contribute to various machine learning fields as well as IQ standardization activities. And which collaborate between teams from different domains or regions who could not have collaborated if there was no such kind of activities. So I'd also like once again to thank the sponsors GT and the Ministry of Science and ICT Republic of Korea, the host of the various problem statements, the judges who dedicated the time to evaluate the solutions, and all of you who competed in the challenge and those who were online today. My special thanks to everyone who joined this session today, and I hope to see you participate in next year's challenge. We already heard many interesting challenges for the next year is ready. So from the vision, so it, it should be excited. So thank you very much again. Thank you and have a good day. So it's my closing remarks. Back to Mia. Thank you very much for your closing remarks. Um, just from my behalf as well, I'd like to say thanks again to all the participants who joined this year, as well as everyone today who has stayed until the very end of today's session. As Thomas has mentioned, please keep an eye out for a special issue for the ITU journal. And as Vishnu has mentioned, please keep an eye out for our future challenges. I hope to see you all again then. With that, I'd like to close today's session. Again, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Excellent. Very well done, Mia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We, we hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good.